Hello, I'm Jesse Paul of the Colorado Sun, and I want to welcome you to the Solution Studio at Metropolitan State University of Denver. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Governor Jared Polis, the incumbent Democratic candidate for governor of Colorado. Thank you for being here, and I would like to thank our three MSU Denver student panelists who would like to take this time to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Julie of the Pawnee, Oto, and Wyandotte Nations. I'm a senior at MSU Denver, graduating in December with a dual bachelor's in healthcare information systems. Hello, my name is Gabe Trujillo. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a dreamer here at MSU Denver. I'm a junior and I'm studying psychology with a minor in Spanish. And hi, my name is James Vargas. I'm a senior here at MSU Denver where I'm studying in political science and history. All right, well, thank you all for participating in the Solution Studios today. We'll be presenting challenge questions to the governor who will have five minutes to respond and then we'll have one round of questions and one round of follow-up questions. You'll have one minute to answer the student questions. Are you ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Right. <laughs> well, Governor Polis, on November 22nd, the nation will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Colorado River Compact. In August 2022, the federal government warned that due to poor management, overuse, and extreme long-term drought brought on by climate change, the states in the compact will need to cut between 2 million and 4 million acre feet of water per year, a reduction of 15 to 30 percent. How will you work to reduce our water use while ensuring agricultural communities, tribes, and our outdoor economy have enough to thrive? So. First, a little bit about the legal framework on the compact. Colorado is an upper basin state. Uh, we're in a stronger legal position um, than the lower basin states, uh, in particularly uh, California, Nevada, Arizona. Uh, effectively, they have cutbacks because the water isn't there. Um, for the upper basin states, the water is there. Uh, Colorado is actually never used up to our prescribed limit. Um, but the truth is, with a hotter, drier climate, uh, we have to find how we can live sustainably as a state in a more water efficient way. Uh, first of all, we should not pit part of Colorado against another part of Colorado. I oppose Trans Mountain diversions. I oppose uh, the San Luis Valley selling their water rights to our fast growing suburbs. We never win when we play one part of Colorado against another. Second, uh, yes, of course, we need uh, more storage and more water investment, but we can't store our way out of a drought. That's also very important to acknowledge. And we need more water efficiency. Uh, and that's across the board. Best practices in ag, helping farmers and ranchers increase their profits uh, with best practices uh, in water efficient agriculture, including some of our work we're doing um, uh, more than you know, pilot and demonstration level grants from our Department of Agriculture, for instance, around agrivoltaics, which is production of solar energy along with crops. The reason I mentioned this in the water context, of course we could talk about it in the energy context, is the partial shade also is a water conservation technique that can lead to reduced water usage for partially shaded crops through agrivoltaics. You know, early to early mid stages, obviously this isn't at scale yet, but these are the kinds of technologies that are gonna be part of making sure that Colorado is a strong uh, ranching and farming community into the future. The second uh, dimension to it is, is housing and how we do housing in Colorado. We need to have more houses and more homes that people can afford close to where jobs are, right? So that means in near where jobs are, also along transit corridors. Uh, from a water sustainability perspective, Colorado cannot afford exurban sprawl. More traffic on our roads, dirty or air, not sustainable from a water perspective, people wasting their time in commutes. We need lower cost options for, for instance, some of our students here, both on the rental market, but of course everybody's dream and the dream of our students home ownership, right? And, and that right now we're in the six to $700,000 range average in the metro area. If we don't take action, uh, that could be, get as bad as some of the other states like California, or Oregon, where it's over a million dollars for a home, less and less affordable. We need to bring that down rather than up, meaning more affordable housing stock in a thoughtful way, a water wise way, uh, as well. So those are some of the ideas that we need to implement uh, really with as a result of the hotter, drier climate and the increased population in the American West. All right. Thank you, Governor. Let's go to our student panel. We're going to let each student ask one question in the first round, and then each student will ask one follow-up question in the second round. We're going to start with Julie. Noah, Governor Paulus, I want to thank you for making the time and space to meet with us today to hear our issues and our concerns and your presence is appreciated and it matters. Um, I would like to speak more on tribal access to water. 
Specifically, in the state of Colorado, there are water reserves that have been allocated to the Ute and the Southern Ute reservations by legislation. You know, it's easy to say this water is delegated for tribal use or free tuition and fees for all students on a tribal roll. But when it comes time to enact these grand announcements, it often seems like it's a lot easier to kind of throw your hands up and helplessly say, indigenous people will kind of take what they can get. And since we are all here on native land, I would just like to know what you will be doing to ensure clean drinking water access to all reservations on Colorado. We work closely with the Ute Mountain Ute and the Southern Ute on a government to government basis. Um, in fact, the Southern Ute just recently concluded their tribal elections. I called uh, the chairman, uh, the chairman elect, he was reelected as chairman, so he's both chair and chair elect, congratulated them just two or three days ago. Uh, and of course, uh, we respect their democratic process, they respect our democratic process, um, and we have a strong working relationship with both the tribal council and the chair. Uh, of course, um, we support making sure that everything uh, that uh, we protect their sovereignty and their ownership of the water rights that they own. So um, they too are engaging in investment and looking at different storage projects. In fact, we invented alongside, we invested alongside the Ute Mountain Ute for a wildlife crossing uh, north of Durango, uh, the tribe put in money, or it's, 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 um, I believe it's technically on tribal land, it's our highway that goes through tribal land, I, I couldn't, I'm not 100 sure whether it's on or off tribal land, but they, they invested and we invested uh, to allow for wildlife crossings and a corridor, decreasing traffic collisions, increasing habitat connectivity, a great example of collaboration, and of course we look forward to collaborating with both tribes on water projects as well. Yep. Awesome. So. As you know, uh, Colorado shares our water with other states and stuff. Um, who are your partners in other states and how are you working with them to help fix this issue? Yeah, so I uh, am chair of the Western Governors Association, which are both has all of the upper basin and lower basin states. It has additional states that are part of that as well. So I have a strong working relationship with my fellow governors. Um, Governor Mark Gordon from Wyoming uh, is our vice chair the immediate past chair, Governor Brad Little of, of Idaho. Uh, and certainly water and fire are one of the top discussions uh, at the Western Governors. Now keep in mind that this is a group of, uh, a bipartisan group. So you have left, right, Republicans, Democrats. So you're not gonna have consensus on anything that's partisan. Uh, but the hard work is kind of forging consensus, which means unanimity or close to unanimity. Um, we, we, we really try to operate together as Western Governors. It's uh, 22 states and territories, Guam, uh, Hawaii, Alaska are part of that as well. Um, and, and, and obviously how we can better prepare for our water future and the increased fire risk are, are two of the important topics that um, are center of discussion uh, around the Western governors, including working with the federal government. One of the things that Western states have in common is the federal government owns uh, a lot of land in our western states, including the land in and around most of our watersheds. So in Colorado, that's mostly U.S. Forest Service land, some BLM land, uh, similar in other states. I think it's roughly 40% of our state is owned by the federal government. In Utah, it's, it's higher, 70%, I don't know, higher percentage, majority of their states owned by the federal government. Uh, so it's really a broad ranging discussion about protecting our watersheds, um, where we find common cause with our fellow governors uh, in advocating with our federal partners. James. Hi, Governor. Again, I want to thank you for being here. I think it's important when candidates and incumbents allow students to take this time to talk to their elected officials and, you know, hear answers from them directly. So thank you for being here and giving us this space. Um, so I know you are heavily involved in new ways of conserving water, such as investing in new water infrastructure. But I'm a little curious, um, what other specific water conversation, conservation projects uh, will you look into in the future, especially around like the municipal level? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of what you might call autonomous entities that work in this area. So they're water districts, they're cities. Uh, I just last week met with, I believe it was the five or six largest water districts in our state. Um, I, had, I had worked with them before when I was in Congress in a more limited way, uh, especially around watershed protection. Um, and that was part of what informed the, the CORE Act which President Biden recently commemorated part of in um, as a national monument, our Senator Bennett and now Congressman Goose, originally when I was there, that was a larger package. We had the support of Aurora Water, of Colorado Springs Water, 
of many of the other water districts because of the strong watershed protection element uh, with regard to uh, the federal lands that were designated as wilderness or an alternative designation similar to wilderness. Um, but yes, we need to engage with all of our municipal and water district partners. And for the first time, and I alluded to this earlier, align our housing policy and our water policy. And so uh, how do we get folks talking uh, between our water districts and our planning boards and our cities and of course the state? There's an important statewide nexus around water that we can then look at development through that lens as one of the valid lenses that we use to determine how we have more housing that people can afford in our state. Thank you, Governor. So now each student will have an opportunity to ask you a follow-up question. You'll have a minute to answer those. So we'll start with Julie. Okay, so I hear you saying, you know, that you work in partnership a lot with indigenous tribes of Colorado. And I do acknowledge that there has been um, quite a few things that you have signed off on for the indigenous people in that state. Um, but I guess what I'm leaning towards with my question would be, how do you intend to use your position of privilege and power to make sure that there is sufficient representation in the negotiations of the Colorado River Compact specifically since we were excluded from that 100 years ago? So um, I'm going to get to the, the direct answer. First, I want to say some of the areas of progress we've made is we have now ended uh, the offensive mascots in Colorado, that there were several of, uh, that schools have moved away from, the stereotypes of our Native American brothers and sisters that is done in Colorado. Um, we also um, have moved forward with looking at offensive place names. There were place names that had offensive terms for Native Americans in those place names. Uh, we've already changed some. There's others that are in, a, in the process where, you know, it, it, there, we have to work through the federal government on, on place names, but we are rapidly moving in that direction. Uh, I hope to uh, be able to see that through if I'm reelected as governor. Um, people should see inclusive place names that um, don't represent people that uh, were, were um, uh, an offensive stereotype. Um, with regards to water, the, the tribes as sovereign nations have their own water rights. Um, so we uh, respect and honor those water rights. They're contractual water rights. Um, just as the state of Colorado has contractual water rights, our, our tribes um, are in very senior positions because of their um, date. They have a very senior water status. And um, I don't believe that any of those water rights of our two tribes, the, the, Mount, the Ute Mountain Ute and Southern Ute, are in jeopardy because of their seniority. So um, that's my understanding. And you know, if there's something that I learned that's different, I'm happy to, to revisit that. But I, I believe their water rights are more senior to uh, really all the others being discussed. Gabe? Awesome. And within um, a, a partner that you also have like um, outside of the state and stuff, who are your partners in internally and stuff who are helping you work um, on this issue? Water, on water? Yes. Well, there's a whole team. So um, Department of Natural Resources, um, under the leadership of, of Dan Gibbs, uh, generally is our, um, under that office, include our, our representatives to the different water camp, compacts and water uh, meetings. We also have uh, water basin roundtables that are local, very local in Colorado. Uh, and so a lot of the innovation and projects and work starts at that grassroots level. So it's counties, it's, it's, it's farmers and ranchers in the area, uh, and then it comes up to the state from the base and round tables to make sure that they're uh, authentic and, and representative of the people that live and rely on the water in those basins. Um, we also have expertise that we're bringing in on the housing and development side uh, around that as well. So, uh, and I would say through Department of Ag, best practices in ag, supporting innovation in agriculture, water efficiency, just as an example, I was at a, uh, you call it an indoor grow facility, greenhouse. I mean, this isn't like anything you've seen. It's a commercial, enormous, I think, you know, several football field size. This is kind of what uh, a lot of, in Europe, a lot of crop production has gone over to in Silt, Colorado. So this is the first of its size in Colorado. Basically, they're growing salad greens. Um, enormous. Uh, about 85 to 90% more water efficient, not to mention year-round production, than growing salad greens outside. So these kinds of technologies that 
uh, have already been in, in implemented in many arid areas of the world for production agriculture are going to be an increasingly important part of Colorado's agriculture future as well. And James. Um, so I'm kind of curious, uh, when you're in a position like yours, like an executive position, you have to make decisions that not many people are going to like, but you have to do it in order for, you know, the good of the country, the state, whatever your position is. So I'm curious, would you ever consider in order to conserve as much water as possible, limiting water use on things like lawns and or golf courses just to help conserve as much water as possible? So it's, it's, uh, it's complicated as a matter of, of jurisdiction. Um, I spoke to the Water Congress in Steamboat Springs two months ago, uh, and I'm happy to share a copy of my remarks to you. But at the time, Aurora was considering, and they've since adopted the city of Aurora, uh, a very forward-looking water code, water-wise, including uh, reducing their irrigated green areas, really only using irrigation where it's needed. I mean, if it's like a soccer field that people play soccer on, they're going to do it, but not just for decorative purposes. So I highlighted that at the time. I lent my support behind it. It did pass the Aurora City Council. Um, but these decisions are made locally across the state. We can do more and we should do more uh, as a state with our state resources. And I'm really going to increasingly try to challenge our state government uh, as part of our overall sort of greening government initiative, not only to lead on energy conservation, electric vehicles, but also water efficiency. Um, in fact, we're going to be reducing the uh, state office footprint or consolidating our offices. We're reducing our offices by over a million square feet over the next three years. Why? Because like a lot of folks, we're able to go to hybrid and some telecommuting and uh, we're able to save taxpayer money, reduce our office space. But that also means reducing our footprint from a water and an energy perspective as well. All right, so it looks like we're gonna move on to our second challenge question. Governor Polis, what will your administration do to address the crisis of mental illness, particularly ac access for youth in our communities? You'll have five minutes for this. This is a very important uh, topic for Colorado. When Colorado received, uh, I'm going to give you two, two sort of parts to this. So wh when I first came into office, we saw a broken structure and I created a behavioral health task force to recommend how to fix it because what we saw is duplication of services across many agencies, complexity from a person in need standpoint, not a very efficient delivery system. Uh, I'm going to update you on that work in a moment. The second thing I want to share is that when the state got the American Rescue Act funding, what an enormous blessing. We have the ability to really invest in, in, in systemic issues that we face as a state. And we did a bipartisan listening tour across the state, Republicans, Democrats, and everywhere we went, you know, Fort Morgan, it was virtual mostly because it was during COVID, but we went a few places, mostly virtual, which was actually convenient because we were able to get your comments from broad geographic areas. We, Fort Morgan, Durango, Grand Junction, Pueblo, couple issues rose to the surface. Housing was one, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but behavioral health in every part of the state really rose to the surface as one of the issues that it was, that our local representatives and community members were hopeful that the state would invest part of this one-time use of funds on. So fast forward to where we are today, working with Republicans and Democrats in the legislature, we've invested close to, we are investing, I should say, it's been, it's been passed, but it's not all invested yet because $400 million. Um, in transformative improvements in behavioral health, including addiction recovery and treatment, including support for our schools. The I Matters program came out of that. That's free mental health counseling for every high school student, right? Any Colorado through age 18. And, and we're looking to expand that access as well. It's also a, a way to have a gateway to additional access to meet the need. I, I mentioned, talked about this at our school safety conference this morning in Adams 12. Um, and and uh, in addition to that, we've restructured how we deliver uh, behavioral health through the creation of a behavioral health administration. So taking these sort of bits and pieces and duplicated elements and trying to put them in one consumer-friendly, patient-friendly way. Because when people are facing a mental health challenge, that's the last time that they want to have to navigate a government bureaucracy, right? I mean, when, when you, nobody wants to navigate a government bureaucracy when you're not facing a mental challenge. You certainly don't want to do when you are facing a mental health challenge. So making that kind of customer and patient centric is the key to that work. It's not done yet, but we've taken the initial steps by consolidating these programs and bringing on board uh, uh, somebody with great patient experience, Dr. Morgan Medlock, to head our new behavioral health agency. All right. So thank you, Governor. And we'll go now to our student panel for questions. This time we're going to start with Gabe. 
Cool. Thank you both for being here. Um, and my question is, mental health is something that impacts every aspect of somebody's life. It has both a biological, psychological, and social impact that really changes somebody's perspective on life and, 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 and has intersections with other identities that they may have. My question is, um, h how will you provide resources um, for people who have the inter intersectionality of being unhoused and having a mental health issue? Yeah, look, um, the Behavioral Health Authority is, is, is really charged with facilitating, of course, it's our local partners on the care delivery side, but making sure that uh, mental and behavioral health is available to, to everybody. Um, and of course, when you look at outreach to particular populations, not only can it be more challenging uh, to reach people who are experiencing homelessness, but there's often going to be an even greater need for some of those services, um, both on the mental and behavioral health side, also going into substance abuse and recovery. Uh, one of the projects we're working on, we got some money as part of our behavioral health package and also our homelessness package to fund um, residential short-term behavioral health and, and drug addiction recovery centers. So we are looking at repurposing um, Ridgeview, just outside in Aurora, on the edge of Aurora. We state happened to own four or 500 acres. Uh, and that's gonna be about 500 residential treatment beds uh, for um, Coloradans who need that, you know, a three to four month program, uh, including transition to supportive housing. Great, James? So as a student who's in student government, I listen to a lot of stories about why students are facing mental illness, and it usually has to do with the amount of things that they're juggling, whether that's going to school full time, trying to get good grades, pay their tuition, pay their rent, feed kids if they have them. They are constantly juggling all these things, and they're being left having to determine, like, what's more important? Do I go to school, or do I feed myself or my kids? Many public universities, such as MSU Denver, are doing what they can to support students with the resources they have but there's so much across the board that they are limited by their resources. So my question for you is, what steps will you take to work with public universities to help better support students? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of stresses in today's society, um, James, and it's um, certainly uh, balancing academic work with having to work on a job with, um, you know, all of the social media and bullying and just things that exist today that um, might not have even existed a few decades ago. And I think that universities are increasingly stepping up and understanding that part of their need is to, to meet the behavioral health needs of students. Our universities are autonomous, right? So I do appoint the board of MSU uh, and, and, and certainly the importance of mental and behavioral health is something that um, I have brought up in, in interviews with board members, prospective board members. Um, but you know the board, of course, hires the president. But I, I, I've generally been pleased with the way many universities are understanding this as part of their core mission. I, I don't think you saw that when I was in school. I, I, I don't in the '90s. Um, I don't recall seeing that. Maybe it was there in a smaller way. But it's certainly a lot more integrated today than it was before. But there's still a lot of room for improvement. Julie. Hello again. Uh, mental health has always been a really broad term. Um, but I feel like that's even much more true today. Um, the world has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, in some ways, those of us who are living in these times are kind of soft. We've never had to experience a world war. Uh, we had never experienced anything like a global full-on COVID pandemic um, before. And the planet's burning up a lot faster than most people anticipated. Um, so we're looking at a really steep transition from what was traditionally thought of in mental health care, you know, when, when you were looking more at specific diagnoses like bipolar, schizophrenia. Now we're at this point where people you would never think of in modern society are struggling with debilitating anxiety and stress just from these really modern issues that we're experiencing. And so I was just wondering specifically how your behavioral health task force that you have set up plans to pivot to serve that wide need. There's an even bigger need now. Yeah, I mean, it means different things for different people. I think uh, some people just need somebody to talk to, and sometimes they're fortunate enough to have a friend in that position or a family member, but others are not, and, and they need somebody to talk to. Uh, there's also people that need 
uh, coping skills. It may be um, skills around how you can um, calm, calm yourself, self-calm and, and self, self-soothing techniques. Uh, so I think that, you know, these are things that are, first of all, that are talked about now. They, they weren't as much in the past, but, but like anything, um, the access is not everywhere to people who need them. I mean, there's absolutely people in some settings and at a university you have more access than, you know, people that are not, for instance, in one place. But there's um, uh, absolutely, we have not reached a place where, you know, people get the help they need when they need it yet. Um, but I think that's certainly the direction that it's going. All right, now our students will get some chances for follow-up questions, and we'll start with you, Gabe. Access, which I think is a huge, huge topic when it comes to any topic, especially mental health. So how will you ensure that that these programs, like the residential short, short-term living and stuff, is accessible and something that people know about who, and it can reach the people who need it? Yeah, I think I think one of the main uh, for that particular program at, at Ridgeview, where we're going to be building houses, it'll mostly be kind of the outreach to the population that's experiencing homelessness in Aurora. There are potentially a similar project for Denver, uh, really talking about alternatives and, and making sure that that's aware. Um, so you know, it's it's about reaching out in meaningful and authentic and culturally relevant ways. I mean, this is not like an ad on TV. This is kind of like you got to reach out through trusted messengers in, in communities. As a public universities, what can what do you feel like you can better do to address you know mental illness amongst college students? Um, because like, like I said, I feel like a lot of college students, when they perceive our government, whether that's local or federal, they don't think they're being supported in any way, shape, or form. We we can really uh, empower. Uh, innovation in this area at our institutions of higher ed. We can talk about the best practices, you know, find who's doing it well, challenge others to rise to the occasion. Uh, we can identify campuses that have persistent problems in this area and, and try to work with them to solve them through data-driven innovative programs. And Julie. Okay, so obviously you have access to far more data than I do. Um, so from your perspective, where you feel like Colorado's mental health care is improving, all I can really offer is my personal perspective. Um, specifically here at Auraria campus, the mental health facilities started uh, capping students at six sessions per semester this semester, um, which is regressive to me. I don't think six sessions are gonna be helpful for very many individuals. Um, and just also personally, before I was a student, even when I had insurance, I had a lot of trouble accessing mental health facilities. It almost seems like if you're not willing to pay out of pocket per session, there's not a lot of realistic ways, means of continued care, because I know even some major insurance carriers over here cap you at mm -hmm. uh, so many sessions per time frame. So um, I'm just, I'd, I'd like a little more elaboration on how we're improving when as a poor student, I, f I feel like we're regressing. Yeah, I mean, look, um, what you're addressing is is a matter of cost, uh, effectively. Um, cost money to provide any kind of healthcare service, physical health, mental behavioral health. Um, sadly, we haven't reached a place where we have universal coverage for physical health needs, no less mental health needs. Uh, for Coloradans or for Americans, many countries have. Uh, Colorado hasn't. Uh, we have focused our agenda on saving people money on health care, means taking on, uh, whether it's big pharma or profitable hospitals or others. And, and it's about two things. Um, of course, it's about saving people money. But what we also fully expect is that some of those savings can go to expanded coverage and better care. Um, and so what you're addressing is really a matter of cost. Um, I don't think it's a matter of ill will. It's not like MSU doesn't want anybody to have more than six. I'm sure it's just a budget thing. I, I haven't talked to them about it, so I don't know that, but I assume that's the case. Um, and so it's really just a matter of figuring out how we can better address some of the, get some of the cost savings in healthcare from um, the disincentives and moral hazards that exist. These are kind of where behavior is not optimal for good patient outcomes. It adds cost, but not better. There's a lot of that in healthcare, especially physical healthcare, probably some in mental and behavioral healthcare. 
uh, and how we can better deploy those savings to doing things like you know, not having a cap of six sessions. All right, well, it looks like we're out of time, but I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank especially Governor Jerry Polis for being here. Thank you to Julie, uh, Gabe, and James, right, and to Jesse. Thank you. Appreciate it. The Solution Studio is a project of the MSU Denver Institute for Public Service in partnership with the Colorado Latino Leadership Advocacy and Research Organization, the Colorado League of Women Voters, and the New Voice Strategies. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jesse Paul. Happy voting.